Uh, welcome to the Lindley Spring Processor Conference. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a principal analyst here at the Lindley Group, also editor-in-chief of Microprocessor Report and um, co-author of our uh, extensive report, A uh, Guide to Processors for Deep Learning. So uh, hopefully uh, you've had a chance uh, to stop by our website and uh, check out some of those products. I'll be kicking off uh, today with uh, some uh, deep learning trends. Then I'll be talking about uh, AI in the data center, uh, AI in automotive, AI at the edge, and uh, ultra low power AI. So there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, models uh, growing in size. Uh, and uh, this uh, graph uh, certainly illustrates that trend. Um, we see uh, image processing models uh, growing at about 2x per year. Um, and the reason is uh, that the uh, accuracy of the model increases as you increase the size of the model. Uh, the small chart in green at the bottom uh, right corner uh, shows a trend in uh, the accuracy relative to the model size, and it's a pretty, pretty distinct trend. Um, similarly, with uh, natural language processing, uh, bigger models are more accurate, and uh, as we're trying to uh, solve bigger problems in uh, interpreting languages and translating languages, uh, the models are growing very quickly, and we see uh, models with as many as um, 17 billion parameters in, uh, in some cases. So um, that doesn't mean that every chip has to handle uh, huge models. Smaller models are adequate for you know, many simpler tasks and certainly vision processing tasks. Um, but uh, certainly uh, some customers are, are seeking these very large model capabilities. We're seeing a lot of different architectures being deployed to, uh, to accelerate AI, and, um, and, and many different architectures actually perform quite well, um, you know, from a, a very large single core architectures and up to uh, hundreds of thousands of cores on a single chip. Uh, there's some, some different reasons why you might want to go with bigger cores or little cores. Uh, little cores are certainly easier to design and, uh, and create large chips. And uh, they are easier to scale uh, from very small power to very high power. Um, but uh, we do see some advantages for big cores as well. Um, big cores require less complicated interconnect because you don't have as many to, to, to connect together. Um, they simplify the compiler design, uh, which helps uh, reach uh, the market quicker and get your customers up and running more quickly. Um, and they're better for real-time workloads where you can only process one uh, item at a time. So, um, so depending on what your workload is and what your goals are, uh, you know, big cores or littler cores you know, may be uh, better for your design. Initially, we, we've seen a wave of uh, systolic array architectures uh, being deployed, uh, but recently we've seen something a little bit different called a convolution architecture. Uh, convolutions are a key part of um, uh, convolutional neural networks, obviously. Um, and so uh, optimizing your architecture to be able to handle these convolutions uh, can increase efficiency over uh, systolic arrays. Um, so, uh, you know, the diagram shows uh, being able to take a three by three convolution um, and providing the nine multiplications at once, adding them together and accumulating the sum uh, using hardware um, that's designed for uh, that function. And, uh, you know, we're seeing some companies uh, in implementing those today in production. Other companies are developing uh, this type of architecture in research. So, um, so we do uh, see a trend in this direction. So that, that does lead to the question of how specialized you want to make your AI accelerator. Um, if you optimize for convolutions, uh, that's really good for convolutional networks, um, but uh, it may not be as good for other types of networks. Uh, we've seen um, uh, some systolic array designs, which are very good for general matrix multiplication, um, and um, uh, that can work well for CNNs as well. 
But uh, if you're doing something other than CNNs or transformer networks with convolutions, uh, you might want to use a more flexible architecture. Um, smaller cores that, that just provide uh, SIMD functions uh, can, uh, can be very efficient across a, a large uh, t number of uh, types of networks. And of course, uh, CPUs, GPU type architectures are really the most flexible, um, providing you know, the best efficiency um, for just about any kind of network. Um, or, or, or I'm sorry, providing, providing good efficiency across you know, almost any kind of network. Um, but the best efficiency will come from these more specialized architectures. Sparse computing is something uh, we'll, we'll hear more about over the next few days. Um, the idea here is that uh, when, when working with a deep neural network, um, it, it turns out that many of the weight values end up being uh, zero or near zero. Um, and, and even many of the uh, intermediate values that you're computing uh, end up being very small. And then when you're multiplying by zero, of course, um, you're not really creating a useful result. So, um, so the idea is to uh, recognize the zero uh, values, uh, disable the, the MAC unit for that calculation to save power, or even ideally uh, rearrange the compute structure uh, to uh, skip over those values and use those MAC units you know, only for meaningful calculations. So we're starting to see hardware that's designed to address this sparsity. We're seeing software tools that can uh, address sparsity as well and uh, use this as another uh, technique to improve neural network performance. Uh, In-memory computing is something that's being investigated uh, by several companies. Uh, we expect to see some products out this year. And um, you know, the idea is to uh, do the compute right next to the storage of the uh, memory values so you don't have to move the data all around the chip. And uh, you can actually do the computation using analog uh, approaches rather than a traditional digital multiplier. Um, and so this, uh, this approach uh, shows a lot of promise in reducing power uh, required to do these calculations by, by 10x, 20x or more. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the manufacturing of these products. And so you know, we're, we're waiting to see if a company can manage to solve those challenges. Another approach uh, that's being used is uh, called binary neural networks. Uh, this, is, this is a fairly new trend that um, will uh, help particularly in low power applications by reducing the weight values down to a single bit. Um, obviously this uh, greatly reduces the storage required, um, but also uh, simplifies the, uh, the multiplication operation and uh, reduces the compute power as well. Um, you might think that using a single bit as a weight uh, would uh, make the network completely useless, but uh, actually uh, we can see fairly reasonable accuracy on uh, many neural networks, even in this binarized format. So uh, we're starting to see um, you know, some, some hardware uh, that is uh, optimized to support these binary networks. And you know, I expect this will be a trend um, for uh, very low power applications. Spiking neural networks is, a, is another approach very different from uh, the, the deep neural networks that most other companies are working on. Um, but this, this approach um, also seeks to save power by only doing computation when something changes. And um, so uh, certainly in, in many applications where you're waiting uh, to see if something interesting happens, uh, this is, this is a, a, a great approach. And uh, we'll be hearing you know, more about spiking neural networks uh, later this morning. So uh, moving on to the data center, um, NVIDIA is uh, still the leader in, uh, in the data center. Um, their Volta V100 is the best-selling processor you know, for AI training right now. And their Turing T4 GPU has uh, been gaining ground recently in uh, AI inference and uh, actually uh, surpassing the V100 in unit sales. So, um, so NVIDIA uh, is, is, is doing quite well with their existing products, but they are getting a little bit long in the tooth. And we've been waiting 
for you know the next generation uh, product from NVIDIA called Ampere, um, but um, you know the, the company hasn't announced that. Uh, we were expecting something uh, recently, and um, e even if the initial um, you know products come out uh, this month, it's not clear whether those are going to be PC GPUs uh, or data center GPUs. So um, you know in NVIDIA remains a formidable competitor, and uh, we're definitely looking forward to this next generation product. Um, but uh, right now, um, it's creating an opportunity for other companies uh, to jump in uh, by not, not being announced. So we are seeing a lot of companies uh, that uh, are challenging NVIDIA for this uh, you know, multi-billion dollar market. Um, uh, Cerebris, uh, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, this week, uh, has developed a 400,000 core chip. Uh, to, to work on these, these huge neural networks I mentioned earlier. Uh, Intel acquired Habana uh, for a, a chip called Gaudi that uh, is used for neural network training. Um, Huawei, um, Graphcore, um, you know, are both offering uh, products for training as well. And um, we have seen one change where uh, after acquiring uh, Habana, Intel dropped their uh, Nirvana technology um, that uh, they had developed uh, for neural network training. Uh, we're also seeing uh, a lot of competition on the inference side. Um, uh, Grok uh, will be presenting this week as well um, at our conference. Uh, they uh, have posted uh, one of the highest uh, ResNet 50 scores among uh, merchant chips. And uh, Habana, uh, part of Intel now, also offers an inference chip uh, that scores better than NVIDIA's T4. Uh, Xilinx uh, has posted some good benchmarks for their FPGA accelerators. Um, Samba Nova, uh, among other companies, are working on uh, inference chips uh, for the data center as well. Uh, Intel did uh, stop uh, developing their Spring Hill chip after acquiring Habana, although uh, they are uh, still applying, uh, supplying it to uh, a few customers. And uh, Wave Computing, uh, has uh, uh, shut down uh, their efforts to uh, develop an inference chip. We're also seeing a lot of de uh, development among the cloud vendors. Um, Alibaba has uh, deployed a very impressive uh, chip um, that uh, has by far the highest ResNet 50 score uh, for, uh, for inference uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, Google has also developed uh, their own chips, uh, three generations uh, for both training and inference. Uh, Microsoft has deployed uh, their FPGA-based solution uh, for uh, a, a small uh, fraction of their search uh, business. Uh, Amazon, uh, Baidu have also developed their own um, ASICs. So, you know, these, these ASICs are, are uh, not uh, being sold, of course, to other companies. Uh, but uh, they are being offered uh, in many cases through uh, cloud uh, services and uh, in, in, in some of the uh, internal deployments as well. So these would block um, other companies from selling into uh, these, uh, these big cloud providers um, in, instead of uh, you know, using these ASICs. Software is a big challenge uh, for a lot of these uh, companies, uh, even after putting together a complex uh, hardware design to accelerate AI, uh, you then have to create a software stack that allows customers to run uh, their neural network models and their AI-based services. Um, these customers are used to working with NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA has an extensive software stack. Uh, most of the popular AI applications and frameworks are built on NVIDIA software. So, um, it's, it's a lot of work for a new company uh, to, to build up this kind of framework. Um, many cases, they're, they're not uh, supporting all of the TensorFlow functions. Uh, these new companies uh, then have problems supporting you know, customer networks that, that won't even compile or aren't fully optimized. So um, you know, just because somebody can show a good ResNet 50 number you know, doesn't necessarily mean that they can you know, replace NVIDIA across the board. And this same problem applies to uh, hyperscale vendors that are developing their own ASICs um, in order to port uh, their, their own internal 
uh, production services, you know, they also have to uh, develop an extensive uh, set of software, uh, which is why, you know, most of these companies are still uh, using NVIDIA for uh, the bulk of their AI services. So moving on to the uh, automotive market, um, you know, there's, there's been uh, some uh, concerns about uh, the deployment of uh, autonomous driving. Uh, things are taking longer than we expected. Uh, we are seeing, you know, some limited production of a few level three vehicles uh, that are able to, uh, uh, you know, perform uh, autonomously in certain uh, highway driving cases. Um, these, these, Cars uh, today are very expensive, and, and the problem is that you need to be able to hand off control from the human driver to the autonomous system, and then back again if there's a problem. So uh, most companies now, uh, most of the automakers are focused on end-to-end -end autonomous operation, which we would call you know, level four uh, operation, and, um, and there's been, uh, been some progress there but it's going to uh, it's, it's going to take a while to to get there. So uh, even though we're seeing uh, you know level two type ADAS uh, becoming fairly widely deployed today, uh, which is really helping uh, improve automotive safety, um, you know the initial autonomous level four vehicles are now probably going to be uh, commercial vehicles uh, operated in fleets. So for example. Uh, we can see autonomous shuttles that operate on fixed routes, uh, robo-taxis that work you know, within a limited area, uh, autonomous delivery vehicles, uh, self-driving trucks. Um, all of these types of vehicles can operate under some fairly limited uh, capability, but uh, can still uh, deliver valuable commercial services. Um, and you know, by displacing professional drivers, uh, which are very expensive, um, you know, you can, you can easily pay for uh, the cost of the autonomous hardware that's required. Um, and, um, you know, so, so this type of uh, deployment is, is something uh, that we believe will happen, you know, within the next few years. Um, so, you know, we have, we have seen some progress here, um, even with the level three capability, uh, seems to be, you know, working fairly well. Um, millions of miles of testing for General Motors. Uh, Tesla is, is still talking about delivering full self-driving this year. Uh, Waymo is performing uh, driverless ride sharing uh, in the Phoenix area. Uh, Intel, uh, with its mobilized subsidiary, is committing to having a commercial robo-taxi service by 2022. Uh, General Motors plans to start producing their autonomous cruise vehicle uh, also in 2022. Um, uh, so, so uh, we do expect to see, you know, some solid progress being made in the next few years. And then by 2025, you know, probably, you know, more uh, uh, consumer luxury vehicles available with some level four capability. Um, and, and of course, uh, growing deployment in consumer vehicles after that year. In terms of suppliers, um, NVIDIA and Intel are the top two providers. Um, Mobilize the leading supplier for level one and level two today. Um, and, you know, NVIDIA has been focusing more on uh, autonomous driving, uh, level four, level five. Uh, NVIDIA has a lot of design wins uh, for those types of systems, but, you know, Intel and Mobileye are certainly um, attempting to compete in that uh, autonomous market as well and have, have uh, won some of their own designs. Uh, some of their own customers as well. So moving further out uh, to the edge, um, we do see some trends of AI um, moving into uh, devices. Um, you know, most of the neural networks today uh, execute in the cloud. Um, you know, for example, when you access your, um, uh, your uh, Alexa device, uh, you would uh, talk uh, to the device, but all of that processing of your voice goes on uh, remotely in the cloud. Um, but this is starting to generate a few uh, problems. Um, one is that the, um, the, the cloud data centers have to add more uh, servers uh, as, as the, as the um, service becomes more popular. And um, 
you know, so they're starting to realize that if you do more processing on a PC or on a phone or on the remote device, um, you know, that, that saves them money. It also allows the system to scale uh, easily um, because uh, every time you add a new customer, you're adding more processing capability. Uh, but there's also benefits to you know, the end user as well. Um, you know, by processing on your own device, um, it reduces latency, so uh, you can uh, respond more quickly. Um, you know, particularly if you're um, using uh, the system, for example, to uh, control your home lighting, uh, you want uh, the lights to go on and off right away. It also uh, allows the uh, system to work if uh, your network connection is is not uh, reliable, if it's if it's if it's down, um, and it also uh, uh, improves privacy. Uh, if if uh, you have a device that's uh, always listening to everything that you say in your house, uh, it's nice that that doesn't get uh, uploaded to the cloud uh, unless necessary. So. There's a trend then toward uh, adding more intelligence further out in the network. Um, you know, one of the places that people are looking is at the edge of the network itself, not necessarily in the client device, um, but, um, but uh, further out in the network. Um, so, you know, for example, many cloud vendors have regional data centers uh, and even uh, metro located uh, points of presence, uh, which reduces latency for uh, video services for voice services. Um, these are kind of, you know, you can think of them as, as just small data centers, uh, still, you know, using the same servers, still running the same software uh, that you would find in, in, a, in a hyperscale data center. Um, but, uh, you know, what's uh, newer is that uh, some of the network service providers want to move uh, intelligence all the way to the very edge of the network. Uh, for example, uh, placing servers uh, you know, near a, a cell tower or a broadband equipment that's deployed into the neighborhood. Um, this would you know, uh, further reduce latency and uh, uh, get your service you know, closer to the customer. Um, but this uh, trend raises some issues. Uh, you know, these servers would have to uh, uh, handle uh, uh, more difficult environmental conditions, uh, stricter power limits, um, uh, you, you may have to figure out a way to host multiple services uh, on a single server. For example, uh, you know, uh, would Apple want to have, you know, their Siri uh, service running, um, you know, on the same server as uh, Amazon's Alexa service? Um, you know, are there security issues there? So, you know, there are some challenges to solve here. Um, but, uh, but we, we see a lot of uh, network service providers very interested in this. Um, and uh, we will be uh, talking more about uh, this trend uh, on, our uh, on our session uh, Wednesday. Smartphones are also uh, gearing up for AI. Um, you know, I think uh, last year I, I said that uh, AI accelerators uh, are standard really in all of the premium smartphones. Uh, now we're, we're seeing uh, AI accelerators uh, really uh, standard now across the board in uh, what we call mid premium smartphones as well. Uh, you know, these are devices that sell for as little as $300. And, um, you know, so uh, everyone, Qualcomm, Samsung, Huawei, MediaTek, uh, Unisoc, all the leading chip providers uh, are um, incorporating AI accelerators into their mid premium uh, devices. And so what that does is it raises the bar in the premium uh, network uh, as well. Um, so now vendors have to uh, position their premium smartphones as having better AI performance than their mid premium devices. So, um, so it's uh, raising the bar in, in that segment and, uh, and the race is on now uh, to uh, see which you know, phone has the best AI performance, uh, just like you know, we're benchmarking uh, CPU performance and graphics performance and imaging performance. So, um, so it's uh, becoming a real competition in the in the smartphone market. And as more phones uh, deploy uh, these AI accelerators, uh, it's starting to enable more applications 
uh, to uh, use these capabilities. So, you know, for example, uh, we see phones now that uh, can use AI to retouch photos automatically, uh, improve the uh, photo quality, um, change the backgrounds. Um, so uh, interesting capabilities. And I think we're just at the beginning of a trend in uh, smartphones to uh, deploy software that can, can do amazing things using AI capability. We're also seeing AI move into traditional embedded applications. Um, one of the nice things here is that the, the barriers to entry are, are not as high uh, to get into this segment. Uh, to get into the data center segment, uh, you need a tremendous amount of performance. Uh, you need a tremendous amount of software uh, to support many different data center applications. Uh, to get into automotive, uh, the performance requirements, particularly for autonomous driving, are very high. Um, there's still a lot of software, there's safety standards uh, to worry about. Um, in, in the embedded market, uh, uh, typically you just have to uh, execute the single application uh, that's appropriate to your end customer. And so that simplifies the software. Uh, the performance targets are, are generally lower, so, um, so this is uh, easier to design the chip. As a result, uh, we're seeing many startups uh, jumping into this market. Um, I've, I've listed several of them here. Uh, I, there's many others that we're, that we're tracking. Um, these are some of the companies that we, we've covered recently in, in microprocessor report and in our guide to deep learning. Um, so, uh, you know, this is really a booming market. And, you know, not only is, uh, you know, the, this, uh, uh, easier to get into, but um, I think there's a good opportunity that uh, you're not just going to have one company that supplies all embedded applications. I mean, we could see uh, a, a, a few companies uh, that succeed in the camera market and a few that succeed in the smart speaker market, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of opportunity here, you know, for startups to succeed and uh, embed established vendors as well. I mean, we're seeing um, some of the leading microcontroller vendors starting to integrate AI accelerators uh, into their products. Um, other established uh, embedded vendors are, are offering chips you know, for this market. So, so it's a really, um, it's a, really a, a booming market right now. A lot of uh, creativity, a lot of new companies. Uh, we'll be hearing from some of those companies uh, in tomorrow's session. So as I mentioned, smart cameras is a, is a key market uh, for these embedded applications. The um, uh, cameras uh, and, and drones, uh, for example, need cameras. Um, so, uh, so being able to uh, uh, process the information uh, using AI is very helpful. Uh, surveillance is a big market. So um, you know, we see uh, uh, products such as uh, you know, Intel's Myriad uh, product, uh, Bitmain, uh, numerous other uh, products that, that offer this kind of one uh, tera ops uh, capability uh, with, with, with just a, a few watts of power. Um, so, uh, so these products are all in production today um, and, uh, and being deployed in, in these kinds of tasks. And then, you know, at the, at the very low end of the market, um, you know, we're seeing uh, demand for AI, um, you know, even in uh, very small, you know, sensor-driven devices, um, you know, microcontroller CPUs, um, you know, can run, you know, not uh, huge networks, but uh, something that can do some, some very useful processing, uh, simple audio applications to uh, listen for uh, voices or listen for gunshots um, can, uh, you know, can run on, um, you know, on a, on a basic microcontroller um, like, uh, you know, Cortex-M0, a Cortex-M4, um, and then, you know, ARM is offering even more powerful uh, microcontrollers um, that, you know, can, can sustain, you know, higher performance and, and, and do more powerful uh, vision-based applications. So, um, so depending on, you know, what kind of application you want to run, um, you know, there are microcontrollers available today uh, that can, uh, can can do many different things, and uh, Google's also uh, working on 
uh, the software side with TensorFlow for microcontrollers. And uh, there's a group called the Tiny ML Foundation um, that's uh, you know, bringing together a lot of the companies uh, that's working in this space. But even uh, you know, at this segment of the market, using an AI engine uh, can improve efficiency. Uh, even if your microcontroller CPU uh, can perform you know, a thousand uh, or I'm sorry, um, a billion uh, max per second, um, that may not be the most power efficient way to do things. And particularly for battery operated uh, devices, uh, you really need to conserve power. And so, you know, we're seeing a demand for uh, small uh, AI accelerators um, that uh, they can operate at very low power. Um, and so particularly if you want to run a vision based application, um, you know, you may need an AI accelerator anyway, because uh, you want to get up to the kind of performance um, that you need for, uh, you know, just doing some basic face recognition, say. So, you know, we're seeing companies, uh, you know, like uh, ETA, uh, like Greenways, like BrainChip, uh, that, uh, you know, are offering uh, products that uh, deliver, you know, pretty strong performance, you know, while operating on milliwatts of power. And, um, you know, so, you know, these devices uh, are really uh, targeting, you know, this, these uh, types of low power sensor applications. And, uh, and we'll be hearing from, uh, we'll be hearing from BrainChip shortly. IP vendors are also, you know, targeting this space. Um, you know, ARM uh, is offering an AI accelerator called Ethos uh, that goes along with their microcontroller cores. Um, SIVA is announcing a new uh, low power DSP uh, at our session tomorrow. Um, you know, and, and several other IP vendors are also uh, working in this space. So, uh, you know, initially we saw a lot of IP being developed for uh, the automotive market. Um, but now some of that uh, IP is being scaled down uh, to uh, target the low cost and low power requirements, you know, in these IoT devices. So um, uh, with that, I just want to uh, give you a quick overview of our schedule, um, you know, to make it easier to uh, sit in on all the sessions, uh, we've divided the program into four half days. Um, so we're starting today, um, uh, after, uh, after this, uh, with our session on uh, ultra low power IoT devices. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're having a long session covering uh, embedded workloads. Wednesday, we're featuring a second keynote, uh, this one from IBM, uh, again, uh, discussing low power AI. And uh, then uh, on Wednesday, after the keynote, uh, we'll have a session on 5G and AI uh, at the edge of the network. And then on Thursday, uh, we'll uh, have a session on the data center, uh, looking at the, the biggest chips uh, that I talked about this morning and uh, uh, several companies uh, talking about uh, their uh, leading edge products. And then uh, we'll close the conference on Thursday uh, with a, a session on new advances in processor design. So, each day, uh, we're going to have uh, breakout sessions at the end of, of the day. Um, we wanted to uh, try to uh, replicate, uh, you know, the, the a normal conference where people can get together and meet and talk to the speakers as best that we can. And so these breakout sessions uh, will be hosted uh, by, the, by the speakers, by their companies, um, and uh, you'll be able to uh, drop in, choose which session you want to visit, uh, uh, stop by different sessions if you want. Uh, they'll be running for an hour uh, after the end of each day. And, um, you know, ha and then that will give you a chance to uh, talk or chat, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the speakers uh, and get more information about uh, their products. So we will be sending uh, information on those breakout sessions uh, later this morning so that uh, please uh, check your email um, for that information. So just to conclude, um, you know, we, we uh, heard about some of the trends in AI accelerators. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new architectures being developed. We're seeing a lot of new techniques uh, being deployed. Uh, this is a very rapidly developing, rapidly changing field. 
and um, we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, focusing on improving performance and power efficiency. Uh, particularly in the data center, we're seeing a lot of competition uh, from both chip vendors and the cloud vendors. Um, and uh, even though NVIDIA is still uh, the leader in market share, we're, we're seeing several new products that are surpassing NVIDIA in performance. So it should be a uh, very interesting competition. But, um, but the thing I think that's holding back some of these new competitors is the software stack. And um, so, uh, so these companies are continuing to uh, refine and develop their software to be more competitive with what the customers need. And um, you know, I think over time, uh, we'll see greater uh, competition there. Um, but that's probably the number one thing holding back uh, the, the data center competitors right now. Uh, in the automotive market, um, you know, we're still seeing progress in autonomous vehicles. Uh, you know, we're still seeing companies uh, pushing forward. Uh, it is taking longer uh, than, than maybe we had originally hoped, but, um, but we do still uh, expect to see uh, autonomous vehicles being deployed uh, in the near future. Many new companies are jumping into uh, embedded as well. Um, you know, the, the barriers entry are lower. And, uh, and we are starting to see volumes ramping uh, in, in uh, embedded AI applications. So, you know, there is an opportunity there and uh, we expect that to be probably the fastest growing, you know, segment in, uh, in AI, uh, looking at, at, at this embedded uh, AI market. And then even uh, for very small devices, uh, we're seeing these tiny ML accelerators uh, that, uh, that can extend battery life, operate at milliwatts of power, improve performance, uh, even in these you know, very low cost sensors. So uh, thank you. And um, I, I can move on to uh, questions now. A question about, uh, question about uh, ma machine learning hardware options. What's the missing piece to really drive machine learning into mass market deployment? Well, it, it does depend on the, the end market, of course. Um, as I said, I think in the, in the data center, you know, software is the thing that's really holding uh, people back. Um, you know, in the embedded space right now, um, you know, I think uh, people are still trying to uh, understand what the, what the business model is, what the application model is. And, uh, you know, do you want to do things in the cloud? Do you want to do them at the edge? What do you do here? What do you do there? I think, um, you know, so, so I, it's going to take some time to, um, you know, work the, uh, work the business model. Um, but I think there, there are going to be tremendous opportunities once, once that's worked out. Um, another question. Um, it seems like this is the AI processor conference. Yeah, I would certainly agree. Um, you know, we've been holding processor conferences for many years. Um, you know, some years it was the network processor conference. Uh, some years it was the embedded processor conference. Uh, recently though, it's certainly AI is the hot topic. And, um, you know, are there other things happening? Um, yeah, I mean, um, certainly, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, trends in, um, in, in the 5G and how uh, in cellular, 5G cellular and how that's driving both infrastructure and uh, smartphones. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, uh, new developments in, um, you know, server processors uh, is an interesting market right now and, and some of the competition that's going on uh, between AMD and Intel. Um, so uh, there's definitely other things going on, but, um, you know, they do tend to get uh, uh, swamped out with all of the AI news. Um, another question, who are the top competitors uh, 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 to NVIDIA and the data center? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's still sorting out. I mean, I think that um, particularly, you know, with the acquisition of Habana, um, you know, Intel is, is a very strong competitor right now. Um, I think other than NVIDIA, Intel probably has the best software uh, for AI right now. <clears throat> and um, Intel was struggling with their, with their hardware, but uh, once they get their software stack running on the Habana hardware, I think that, um, that, that Intel is going to have a very 
uh, strong solution in the in the data center. Um, but uh, you know, we're also seeing some very uh, innovative architectures, you know, from uh, from from several companies. And you know, once they can get their their software stacks working, you know, we'll be able to sort out, you know, which which of the startups is really going to be you know the the strongest competitor. Um, let's see. Yeah, what what is the avail uh, what is the opportunity for interoperable network neural network formats like Onyx? Um, so Onyx, you know, certainly helps. Um, you can you can take networks from different uh, frameworks. You know, PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow. Um, you know, whatever your favorite framework is, export it in the Onyx format. And a lot of the startups are using that then to uh, drive their software stacks. Um, you know, the problem is, I mean, that that just gets the the network into your software stack. You still have to support all of the different capabilities that Onyx supports, you know, which it, which is onerous. And um, and you, you you still have to be able to optimally uh, optimize performance, um, you know, for those different networks and different types of networks. So so Onyx is certainly very useful and um, you know, it, it helps the, um, it, it helps get, uh, get the software going, but it, it's not the entire solution. Um, so I can, I can try to do uh, one or two more questions here. Um, yeah, so yeah, by, yeah, and by weak software stacks, the question is, what do I mean by weak software stacks? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a question of not being able to support, um, uh, you know, all of the functions in 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 TensorFlow or Onyx, uh, which which uh, prevents customers from compiling uh, their networks. Um, it, it's uh, not providing all of the libraries that that Nvidia offers. Not offering uh, all of the tools for things like quantization and pre-processing the network uh, for sparsity, for example. It's uh, you know, not uh, uh, being able to um, uh, debug the the, uh, the network easily, um, not having the tools to do that. Um, so there's a lot of capabilities that you would uh, that you would get um, from um, from neural networks uh, from you know Nvidia, for example, and um, you know the um, you know that that just aren't being offered by some of the startups. Um, yeah, we got a lot of questions here. Let me see, um, you know, what else? Um, do I have a market size for each segment? Yeah, I, I don't have time to go into that, but that's in our uh, guide to deep learning. Um, so, uh, yeah, here's an interesting question to, to uh, end up on. So if edge AI succeeds at improving privacy, will that hamper future networks because there will be less data to train them with? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, it could. I mean, obviously, not everything can get done at the edge. Um, some things are still going to have to go uh, to uh, the, the cloud. Um, but yeah, today, you know, cloud vendors are, are harvesting all of this data, um, you know, from, from these devices. And, and some of this is, you know, personal data um, that, uh, that they're using uh, to train their networks. And um, you know, if 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 more uh, of this uh, data is being kept uh, at the edge, then um, you know, then they're going to have to figure out a different way uh, to to get data that they need to train. I mean, you see uh, the autonomous uh, uh, driving companies uh, you have to drive their cars, you know, around uh, you know different places to get the data that they need to train their network. Um, you know, whereas the cloud vendors just kind of, you know, open up an internet connection and, and get flooded with data. So, um, you know, we may have to see, you know, companies working harder to, um, you know, to get, uh, get their data uh, to train some of these new networks. Thanks.